On the night of May 4th, 2014, a San Antonio, Texas resident named Joey Maldonado decided to pay his friend, Julian Pesina, a visit. Pesina was employed as a police officer for Balcones Heights, a small enclave inside San Antonio. Julian Pesina was a patrol cop in the otherwise tiny police force, but he had a somewhat unusual side job for a peace officer in Texas. Pesina owned a small tattoo shop, Notorious Inc., and would spend many of his days off there, not just as the owner, but with a tattoo gun in hand, personally inking up clients. This day had been no different, and around 9.45 p.m., Pesina was ready to shutter the doors and call it a night. His friend noticed that something was off about him. Pesina mentioned having recently seen his daughter, which should have been good news, as he'd had ongoing problems with her mother after they had split. But Pesina seemed abnormally agitated, preoccupied, and nervous, and frequently glanced at his phone as they conversed. Finally, Pesina told Maldonado not to wait up for him, and Maldonado headed off into the night, leaving Pesina to lock up the doors to Notorious Inc. and go home. Pesina sensed danger that night, but he couldn't have possibly known that over the past few days, members of a gang known as the Texas Mexican Mafia, or Mexiconomy, had literally dug a grave for him outside in the South Central Texas wilderness. In fact, the only thing that had saved Pesina thus far was his paranoia, but that was about to change. Despite Texas's track record as a state that's perfectly willing to execute cop killers, the Mexiconomy's leaders were so dead set on murdering this police officer that they had now decided it was worth the risk of a public assassination. At 10 p.m., Pesina received a text message as a white Pontiac Sunfire pulled up in front of his shop. He got up, walked outside, and conversed briefly with the driver, unaware that the two men donning dark blue hoodies and ski masks were approaching to his side, one armed with a pistol and the other with a shotgun. They ran up and opened fire, striking Pesina several times. As he fell, they dove into the back seat of the Sunfire and sped away, evading detection of law enforcement who poured onto the scene within three minutes of the shooting. As police taped off the crime scene, Pesina's killers were working to cover their tracks, hiding the vehicle, destroying the murder weapons, and laying low around San Antonio. The initial investigation turned up few clues. There were no eyewitnesses of any value, and Maldonado had no idea who Pesina was supposed to meet that night. But what no one knew, not Pesina, not his killers, and not even the Balcones Heights homicide investigators who showed up to the scene that day, was that the FBI had captured the entire murder on video. Just a few days prior, an FBI agent disguised as an electrician had climbed a pole near Notorious Inc. and installed a hidden camera pointed directly at Piscina's shop. For you see, Julian Piscina was not merely a police officer who happened to own a tattoo parlor. He was a man of many secrets, and he lived a double life. Today's episode will focus on the Mexiconomy, the murder of Julian Piscina, and the web of killers, snitches, corruption, and gang infighting that he found himself caught in. It is a tale of betrayal that centers on a man who is living on both sides of the law, but who, as you will see, was far from the only one to harbor such secrets. To understand the gang's roots, we have to go back to the 1950s in California, where the original Mexican mafia formed within the state's prison system. Within just a few years of its foundation, the gang became known worldwide as an extremely dangerous and deadly criminal organization that controlled much of the legitimate and illegitimate businesses around Los Angeles through this one truth, that criminals and gang members will inevitably end up incarcerated. And when they do, they can't have angered those with the power to kill them inside prison walls. While plenty of other prison gangs had formed by the 1950s, the Mexican Mafia's quick rise to power represented a new tier in the history of organized crime, and other groups around the country took note. That brings us to the 1980s in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, where a man named Heriberto Herbie Huerta decided to form a Mexican Mafia of his own. According to commonly accepted history, 
Huerta gained permission from the leaders of the California Mexican Mafia, then drafted a constitution for what would become the Texas Mexican Mafia, or Mexiconomy. He first attempted to pass off the gang as a religion based around Aztec culture. But when the Texas prison system didn't go for it, that pretense was basically dropped altogether. The Constitution has basically stayed unchanged since the original. One version from 1991 describes the organization as soldiers of Atzlan, who exist to, quote, advance benefits for our families, our race, and the generations which in the future will represent what we have founded by totally liberating the Mexican nation. It also contains provisions for making money through any means necessary, including narcotics trafficking, murder contracts, robberies, extortion, prostitution, and whatever other commercial enterprise anyone deemed worthwhile by the gang decides to undertake. As you may have already guessed, the Texas Mexican Mafia takes on a paramilitary structure with officers like generals, captains, and lieutenants, all the way down to prospects and associates. While the people who filled these ranks could be rotated out or even demoted, one thing stayed constant. Huerta was given the role of president for life, and another state prison inmate named Benito Alonso was made lifelong vice president. The Constitution bans gambling beyond the value of a pint of ice cream, as well as, quote, heavy teasing between members, and makes it clear that treason will be punishable by death. In its early years, the Texas Mexican Mafia's main purpose was protection from other groups in prison, most notably the older and larger Texas Syndicate. But it quickly evolved into a criminal organization with power inside and outside of prison, akin to the Mexican Mafia structure in California. Of all of the cities in Texas, the Mexiconomy has the most power in San Antonio, which the gang claims as its capital and divides into four corners for the north, south, east, and west sides of town, each led by a general who then reports up the chain, with a main general controlling the entire city, who keeps in touch with Huerta and or Alonzo. Within city limits, the gang has such enormous control that it decreed San Antonio drug dealers must pay an extortion tax of 10%, or $100 per ounce, which is commonly known as the dime. If you're a drug dealer who does not want to pay the dime, the Texas Mexican Mafia is very reasonable. They'll give you one more chance by sending people to your house to hold you at gunpoint, ransack the place for valuables, and possibly assault you, rather than just moving straight to murder. By the 1990s, Huerta had been convicted of racketeering and sent to ADX Florence, a prison known as the Alcatraz of the Rockies that has a reputation for being the most high security penitentiary in the continental United States. There, he became known as one of just a handful of gangsters nationwide who holds the power to control the streets from a tiny, secluded cell. In the same vein as figures like Larry Hoover, Barry Mills, or Pistol Pete Rollick. In 1994, the same year Huerta was sentenced, a power struggle began within the Mexican Mafia resulting in the murders of Jose Treviso and James Rivas in April of that year. A Texas Mexican Mafia general named Robert Beaver Perez was convicted and sentenced to death five years later of shooting both victims, under the theory that he was searching for Luis Blue Adames, a man who was challenging Huerta for control of the gang, but ended up in a shootout with Adames' supporters. Adames was killed seven months later, allegedly on Perez's orders. Three years after that, in 1997, Texas Mexican Mafia members committed one of the most brutal crimes in San Antonio's history, murdering five people during an extortion attempt in what came to be known as the French Place Massacre. Perez was also convicted in federal court of orchestrating those murders, and prosecutors say they believe he ordered 12 to 18 killings around the same time. That case was largely corroborated by the Mexiconomy hitman named Frank Estrada, who admitted to committing no less than seven murders for the gang, yet was granted transactional immunity to testify on behalf of the prosecution. This would be far from the only time the Fed showed their willingness to make deals with admitted murderers in order to prosecute the Texas Mexican Mafia. As for Perez, he was executed in 2007. 
For the sake of convenience, the Texas Mexican Mafia's middle management is split between prison and the streets. According to the testimony of gang dropouts, members who reach a certain rank in prison and are released are immediately stripped of that rank and must prove themselves to the presiding general or high-ranking officer in order to be accepted in the outside world. The inverse of this is true too. Those who go to prison must climb the ladder behind bars, regardless of their rank on the outside. The benefits of this are an extra layer of security to vet members, while keeping the centralized leadership of Huerta and Alonso in place. In keeping with this theme of separate yet connected, a common symbol of the Mexiconomy is a two-headed serpent whose body squirms to form the shape of the letter M. But no amount of vetting can be 100% foolproof, and that's where Julian Pesina enters this story. If nothing else, Officer Pesina was a man of internal conflicts. He sought out a law enforcement career, working as a jail guard at a GEO detention facility before joining Balcones Heights Police in 2009. Yet he was clearly fascinated by life within organized crime. Those who knew him would later testify that he had close family members that were associated with the Mexiconomy. And outside the uniform, Pesina looked more like a Mexiconomy member than a cop. He was covered in tattoos with implicit or even straightforward references to the gang, any of which should have raised serious red flags to any law enforcement officer who saw them. On his Facebook page, he was friends with both officers and gang-affiliated people. But that was far from the worst of it. It turned out that Officer Julian Piscina didn't just earn a living by patrolling the streets and tattooing. He was a drug dealer who peddled heroin and meth in the very same community where he was arresting people for similar crimes. But knowing full well he was operating in an area where drug dealers who get too successful draw the ire of the Texas Mexican Mafia, Piscina sought protection in a foolishly cunning way. In early 2014, Pesina checked in with a Northside San Antonio Mexiconomy member named George Munchies Castillo, explaining that he'd been made a member of the gang long ago, but had been out of the loop for the past six years. In an even riskier move, he admitted to owing thousands of dollars for failing to pay the dime during this time, explaining that a previous Mexiconomy lieutenant named Johnny Smiley Solis a man who had recently vanished and was presumed murdered, had charged him so much he couldn't keep up. He claimed that he joined the gang while incarcerated, using his former experience as a jail guard to drop names of imprisoned Texas Mexican Mafia members as proof that he had been in the mix. The gang temporarily took him at his word, but deliberately kept him out of the loop while they worked to verify his claims. Amazingly, by the second week of February 2014, the Texas Mexican Mafia had determined Pesina was, in fact, a member, and placed his name on rosters that were distributed to Mexiconomy officers in San Antonio. It was a roster that included many names, and was constantly changing as members got promoted and demoted with time. We're not going to meticulously go through each officer, but here are a few key figures to remember. There was Ruben Menes Reyes, the Northside lieutenant who entered that position in January 2014, after Johnny Solis vanished. Under him was the sergeant, Jerry Idrogo, who had proved himself as a worthwhile member by murdering 41-year-old Billy Padilla at his Charbon Drive home months earlier in August of 2013. Idrogo had scoped out the place followed Padilla into the home and shot him execution style with a pistol in front of Padilla's elementary school aged son. Idrogo had been given a time limit to commit the murder and let it lapse, but still gained entry into the gang after its completion. In February 2014, after Pesina had been cleared as a Mexiconomy member, it was Idrogo who started taking Pesina with him to collect dime payments around the north side. Pesina's role would be the muscle, he was essentially a driver and backup security for Idrogo in the case someone resisted making their payment. As Idrogo's helper, Pesina was not allowed to have a phone during dime collection. One of the highest ranking members outside of prison who'd been placed in charge of San Antonio was a man named Raymond Tellez, also known as Indio. 
a longtime member involved in multiple murders who was perfectly willing to call hits, firebomb houses of those who failed to pay the dime, and who raked in hundreds of thousands of dollars in illegitimate income every year. But Tellez had a secret no one in the gang knew. In October 2012, when he was still a lieutenant, he had been pulled over by police and caught with enough drugs to justify a lengthy prison term. Because of this, he'd brokered a deal with authorities and offered to work for the San Antonio Police Department in order to be allowed to stay on the streets. Tellez's work as an informant produced results, including the arrests of 22 people involved in a heroin, methamphetamine, and money laundering conspiracy, all while Tellez remained in good standing with the gang. As a matter of fact, with the full encouragement of police, Tellez was promoted to general of San Antonio for the Texas Mexican Mafia, which seemingly made him the perfect police informant. There was just one small catch. Raymond Tellez was still operating as a full-fledged gang member. He was still selling drugs and carrying guns as a felon, which authorities may have been able to wrap their heads around for a while, but he was also still murdering people. After the jig was up and he was busted for drugs and firearm possession in May 2013, Tellez admitted to participating in two murders that occurred after he'd become an informant. Both committed while police were encouraging him to rise the ranks of a gang where killings were the best means of upward mobility. As for Julian Pesina, he was not a double agent like Perez nor was he operating some kind of deep cover mission for either the Mexican-Texas Mafia or law enforcement. He was a man who lived and worked as an officer, but went out of his way to become a henchman for the strongest and most violent gang in the city where he worked. He was well aware that the risks were enormous. If the FBI found out what he was doing, he would go to prison for years. If the Texas Mexican Mafia found out, they would try to kill him. And as it turned out, by April 2014, both the FBI and the Texas Mexican Mafia had discovered Pesina's secret. And while neither group knew it at the time, they were in a race to see who would deal with him first, while Pesina's life hung in the balance. For the FBI, it all started in September 2013, when a suspected heroin dealer was arrested, his phone was seized, and was eventually turned into a confidential informant. Among his phone contacts was a Julian who had been texting the informant about drug transactions in a not-so-subtle language, as well as texts with known Texas Mexican Mafia members. By December of that year, FBI Special Agent Marty Martinez was convinced that the Julian in the informant's phone was Julian Piscina, and he was determined to root him out. They arranged for their informant to buy methamphetamine from Piscina, but an unexpected quirk arrived. Pesina was paranoid and somewhat more meticulous than his tendency to flaunt his own gang tattoos on Facebook would suggest. He refused to do hand-to-hand -hand transactions, and instead fronted meth to the CI by leaving it in a flower pot for the informant to pick up. So while the FBI had basically proved he was a meth dealer at this point, before he could be prosecuted for meth distribution, Pesina needed to pay the informant and complete the deal. That was supposed to happen sometime in the first week of May 2014, right around the same time Piscina was killed. But despite all this evidence, the fact that Piscina's arrest was imminent, and the possibility Piscina was committing violence for a gang that cultivates killers, the FBI notably decided against telling the Balcones Heights Police Department about Piscina. Not even the chief of police was kept in the loop. Authorities would later attempt to downplay this omission, but when the Texas Department of Public Safety agent Brian Vajos was asked under oath if they deliberately kept the Balcones Heights police out of the loop because they weren't sure how deep the corruption ran, he said, that's possible. In April 2014, agents placed the secret camera outside Notorious Inc. Within days, known Mexicanami heavy hitters were seen visiting the tattoo shop including Ruben Menes Reyes, who is fast earning a reputation as a killer with no scruples, as well as Jerry E. Drogo, who received a Mexican Army tattoo at the shop from Pesina himself. But if this meant that Pesina and E. Drogo were becoming fast friends, that was about to change quickly. It all started one day when they were doing their dime collections at the house of a drug dealer named Vic, who went by Vicky. 
Pesina seemed nervous the second they got there, and after a few minutes in the house, he abruptly got up and headed for his car, leaving Idrogo inside the house with Vicky, in a clear breach of protocol for dime collections. Vicky then confronted Idrogo, demanding to know why he had brought a police officer to his house. Idrogo was not amused. Quote, Look what you're implying, that guy's a carnal, right? And he's my carnal. If I find out you're lying to me, I'm going to kill you, Idrogo told him, but Vicky didn't falter. He woke up his boyfriend, who independently knew of an officer named Julian Pesina, then went online and showed Idrogo pictures of Pesina in a police uniform. Then he picked up the phone, called the Balcones Heights dispatcher, and asked to speak to Julian Pesina. The dispatcher said Pesina wasn't in there yet, but would be soon. Stunned, but with no other way to get back home, Idrogo returned to Pesina's vehicle outside and was surprised to see Pesina on the phone, once again violating protocol for dime collections. As soon as he could, Idrogo told his lieutenant, Ruben Reyes, what he'd learned. Reyes thought about it for a couple days, then returned with his decision. Quote, he's gotta go. Idrogo's plan was to lure Pesina to a place where he could be killed with no witnesses and to be buried in a remote part of the wilderness, which the gang had done countless times before. But Pesina had sensed danger, and he didn't give them an opportunity. Frustrated and impatient, Reyes then gave Idrogo an ultimatum to just get it done, whatever the risk. Idrogo wasn't about to murder Pesina on his own, but was allowed to take his pick of hitmen. He settled on Alfredo Freddy Lo Cardona, a Texas Mexican Mafia prospect who just needed to commit a murder to join the gang, and Jesse Santibanez, a member of the gang who had been recently demoted for a screw up and needed a way of rising into the ranks again. On the night of the murder, a lot of stuff went wrong. A fifth co conspirator who was supposed to steal a car for them completely failed. It would have been smarter to postpone things, but Idrogo was feeling the pressure from Reyes, and he decided to go ahead with it. They used Cardona's Sunfire, but switched the paper plates out with those from the car of Santibanez. Cardona grabbed a 9mm pistol, while Santibanez wielded a shotgun. Idrogo drove and dropped them off around the corner from Notorious Inc., then instructed them simply to shoot Pesina when he exited the shop, and to hop into the vehicle. It didn't quite go so smoothly. Idrogo pulled up and texted Pesina as planned, but the gunmen were nowhere in sight. As he approached the car, Pesina, armed with a pistol, sensed something was wrong and began to question Idrogo with an ire of suspicion. Idrogo told Pesina he was tired and just wanted to collect Pesina's dime payment and go home, all while wondering where the hell Cardona and Santibanez were. After a few moments, Idrogo took his foot slightly off the brake of the sunfire, and when the brake light flickered, the gunman came bursting out, firing multiple rounds at Pesina. He was struck three times, any one of which could have been fatal on its own. Afterwards, they gave the guns to Reyes for destruction and were told to lay low. Idrogo, concerned by both the prospect of being arrested and of being murdered as the gang tried to cover its tracks, fled to a relative's in Ohio. But the FBI poll camera had already given authorities the evidence they needed to track down Cardona as a suspect. He was the first of three to be arrested. Idrogo's turn came when authorities raided his mother's house in San Antonio, and he got on the phone with a detective and promised to turn himself in. He was extradited from Ohio to Texas, and it decided his time as a gang member was over. He made a deal with federal prosecutors admitting to both Billy Padilla and Julian Piscina's murders, and agreed to testify against Santibanez and Cardona. On the stand at their trial in 2017, he said that Padilla's murder still haunts him. Raymond Tellez also offered up his testimony as a part of a deal where he admitted murdering four people, two of whom were killed after he became a government informant. One of them, Jose Figueroa, was strangled with an Xbox cord and stabbed to death at a gang meeting with dozens of members present. The three others, Jose Bravo, Adam Trevino, and Vincent Chacon, were fatally shot for owing money to generals or falling behind on dime payments. There was just one more piece to the puzzle missing. Ruben Menes Reyes, 
On November 9, 2014, four Texas Mexican Mafia hitmen knocked on Ray's door and opened fire when he answered it. He was hit only once, but required hospitalization. Five days later, after accepting he was now a target for murder by the gang, he offered himself up as a government cooperator and dropped perhaps the biggest bombshell yet. He led them to a remote location in Pearsall, Texas, on Armadillo Road, and told the feds to dig. On November 19th, 2014, exactly where Reyes said they would be, authorities uncovered three bodies. Amazingly, Reyes revealed that he had killed all three men on the same day and dumped them there all at the same time. One of them was Johnny Smiley Solis, the man Reyes replaced as the North Side Lieutenant, and the man whose death Pesina had used to his advantage in order to gain footing in the Texas Mexican Mafia. Reyes said that in December 2013, he'd been ordered to kill Smiley, as well as Texas Mexican Mafia General Carlos Worm Chapa and Captain Mark Anthony Bernal, aka Lefty, for mishandling $60,000 in Mexiconomy funds and for other questionable leadership decisions. In fact, the Texas Department of Public Safety had learned Bernal's life might be at risk and attempted to warn him, but he apparently brushed them off. Reyes would later plead guilty to the three murders plus Pesinas and be sentenced to multiple life sentences. In 2017, Santi Banez and Cardona were convicted by a Texas jury that deliberated for just a couple hours before returning guilty verdicts on racketeering and murder charges. On August 15, 2018, the day he was sentenced to multiple life terms, Santi Banez rose in court to thank his family for their unconditional love by attending the trial and staying in touch with him during his incarceration. He then said, quote, I would also like to express and let it be known that I am innocent of these charges and that the government and prosecutors have punished me for exercising my constitutional right to a trial by impeding my every step with a superseding indictment, mandatory life enhancement, and false testimony of government witnesses, who at trial were the self-proclaimed authors of this crime. On that last point, it's hard to argue with Santi Benez. While Reyes did receive a life term, Tellez and Hidrogo both received 20-year prison terms, despite admitting participation in multiple murders each. For Tellez, though, Testifying against the Texas Mexican Mafia nearly became a death sentence. While incarcerated at a GEO facility awaiting trial, he was stabbed by two gang members who had learned that he was a cooperator. Tellez survived the attack, sued the facility for failing to protect him, and is currently scheduled to be released from federal prison in 2029. Before Santi Benez was sentenced, U.S. District Judge Xavier Rodriguez made one last symbolic gesture. While he still sentenced Santi Benez to life, Rodriguez refused to impose a federal law designed to punish people who assault or kill police officers during the performance of their lawful duties. Quote, In this case, Pesina was a bad cop, Rodriguez said. He wasn't retaliated against because he was a police officer. He was being retaliated against because he failed to tell the mafia he was a police officer, and so they couldn't trust him anymore. Thanks for listening. We will be following up on this video soon with a look into the prison side of the Texas Mexican Mafia. Stay tuned.